Okay, welcome to this video lecture. Um, this topic is, or this video lecture is going to cover kind of three topics that are related somewhat loosely, um, but which individually didn't warrant sort of their own <laughs> uh, video lecture. So we're going to talk today about speciation, the process of creating new species. If you've been following along, you should have already done some reading, background reading about speciation. We're going to talk about types of selective pressures. We've talked about selective pressure in general when we talked about selection and um, natural selection, artificial selection, but we're going to talk about selective pressures and how they affect populations. And then we're going to go on and talk about the kinds of evolution that scientists have identified since Darwin described the process of evolution. So how do animals actually, or the, the patterns of evolution that we observe, because there's a couple of different patterns. So let's start off with speciation. Again, this is a little bit of review. Uh, if you've been following along with the reading and practice activities, you should already know that speciation is um, the process in which evolution creates new species. Um, you should know the definition of a species, which is essentially an organism which is uh, reproductively isolated from those that are most closely related to it, meaning they can't produce viable offspring. Although the definition of species is actually somewhat in debate in the field of biology and if you really want to get uh, a group of evolutionary biologists or um, worked up ask them what a species is they uh, there, there is some disagreement but the basic definition is that animals that can't reproduce with each other so here these animals are all these fish they're all cichlids but we consider them each to be their own species because though they are related to each other in in the not so distant past um, they each uh, are reproductively isolated. The, the yellow cichlids will only reproduce with other cichlids of that same kind, and the banded with only with other banded cichlids. So what does speciation require? Well, the first thing that speciation requires is isolation. Okay, uh, In order for an organism to, to split and create a... a, a um, to create... to split to create two new species, um, and we've seen that pattern before, this kind of pattern, this branching pattern. In order for this split right here to occur, uh, first you need isolation. Okay, um, The isolation allows the second thing to occur, which as if there's differences in selective pressure in the two different environments, then the organisms will become new species. So here's a picture of one of those lava flows from that example of the mice uh, in the lava fields those mice have different selective pressures the ones that live on the black lava compared to the ones that live on the yellow tan soil surrounding it they're isolated from each other by the fat by the sheer difference between the black lava and the tan lava and so there's differences in selective pressures Darwin did a lot of research on the Galapagos Islands it was one of the places that he traveled to on his his uh, tour as a young man and each of the islands on the Galapagos was inhabited by certain animals, but each island also had different selective pressures. So the animals were isolated from each other. Um, there were tortoises on all the islands. There were certain kinds of lizards on all the islands. Um, but because each island was different, there were different selective pressures. And this can occur even in areas like here in California. You're going to see an example after this video of salamanders, which um, are all related to each other. They come from the same original species. Um, in fact, they're still considered the same species, but look very different. The original species started up here in Northern California and has traveled kind of in a circular pattern around this kind of big valley in the center of the state. And in each of the different regions that they live in, they're, they are beginning to appear very different from one another because of differences in the environment, differences in selective pressures. So we need those two things. Um, let's do one specific example in more detail. So let's talk about the Galapagos Islands. Um, series of islands far off the coast of uh, South America. And um, occasionally throughout evolutionary time, species from the mainland have ended up on these islands and begun reproducing and developing their own populations. So we have isolation. They can't get back to the mainland. Um, they get their through a variety of ways, blown there by storms or floating out on rafts of wood that get washed out during floods, things like that. But um, we have isolation. Each island is isolated from each other and from the original mainland population. Um, 
so that's led to a couple things. Darwin observed that on some islands, uh, like Isabella Island, the finches, these little ground birds that on the mainland looked like this, had evolved through natural selection to feed on many different kinds of food. So some were seed eaters, some were eating the cactus blossoms, some were eating worms, others were eating larger insects, and each one had evolved its own distinct shape beak in order to get those things. Um, and this was an example of of evolution. Another example, on different islands they have different kinds of tortoises. So let me pull this off here. Um, we still have isolation, but now we're talking about isolation not from the mainland population, but isolation from one island to the next. So Pinta Island all the way up here in the north is very dry. The tortoises that came from there uh, had kind of a saddle back and a big kind of sway in the, the top of their shell and their neck was very long because they had to reach up to get fruits off of these plants which were quite a bit taller and drier and there wasn't nearly as much food available so they had to be able to access a greater range of food. Uh, on Santa Cruz Island and some of the islands to the south that were a little bit more lush, the turtles don't have that saddle back. They're a different species, not turtles, excuse me, tortoises. Um, but uh, and their necks were shorter because their food source was different. So we have now isolation and we have a difference in selective pressure. And that has created different species. In fact, this is Lonesome George. He was the last of his species. He lived. Uh, he was a tortoise from Pinta Island. He lived well over 100 years but died just a couple of years ago. Um, now ultimately, geographic isolation, so isolation in terms of geography, can lead to reproductive isolation. And reproductive isolation is when species will no longer reproduce. So Lonesome George, they tried for years to get tortoises from other islands to reproduce with him because he was the last of his species. And George would not reproduce with any of them. And, and part of the reason for that is that um, these tortoises, because for so long they'd been on different islands, are reproductively isolated. They will not reproduce with each other. Okay, now isolation without different selective pressures doesn't lead to speciation. So a quick example here. Here's a here's an urban lake in Minneapolis. This is Lake Nokomis, um, and we think of a population of fish in there, largemouth bass. Well, there's plenty of lakes in Minnesota that also have largemouth bass and are are isolated from Lake Nokomis. So why are the largemouth bass in Lake Nokomis not different from largemouth bass in Lake Mille Lacs or Potato Lake or whatever lake you want to think of. And the reason for that is there's no difference in selective pressure. The pressures on the fish population here are essentially that the same that they are in any lake in Minnesota and really almost throughout the United States. They're about the same. So the, the spe bass species, largemouth bass species throughout the United States are relatively constant. Um, without a whole lot of variation in terms of that species. And it's because there's no difference in the selective pressure. So that's um, speciation. Now let's talk about the kinds of natural selection. And here we see three graphs of the three kinds of natural selection, disruptive, stabilizing, and directional. And on these graphs, the red line here represents sort of the original population before natural selection occurs. The blue line represents how the population changes as a result of natural selection. So this occurs when natural selection does this and favors traits at the extremes, we have a kind of natural selection that's called disruptive selection. When natural selection favors organisms that are in the middle rather than those at the extremes, we call that stabilizing selection. And when natural selection favors those on one end, one extreme, we call that directional selection. So organisms getting pushed in one direction. And let's think about some examples. These could be practice problems. So the katydid, right? We had pink, yellow, green katydids. And over time, the katydids, the selective pressures push the katydids to almost all be green. Which kind of selective? direction selection is this and if you said stabilizing selection you were correct because it favored those that were in the middle rather than those that were on the extremes um, think about the example I just talked about of the finches on the Galapagos on one Galapagos Island where they're radiating out and and each finch is feeding on its own food source um, 
and changing from that sort of original Finch pattern. What is that? It's an example of disruptive selection. Um, because traits on the extremes, extremely long beak, extremely thick heavy beaks are favored over the average sized beak. Um, as those birds populations change to use up different resources in the environment. What about the turtles? Or the tortoises? I keep calling them turtles. They're not turtles. They are tortoises. Um, and the, the changes that occurred from one island to the next. So on Pinta Island, Lonesome George and his ancestors were favored to have very long necks in this saddle back in this sway right here. And that's, you may have guessed, an example of directional selection, where individuals on one extreme, those with the longest necks, are favored. So you'll be asked to think of what kind of selection pattern we're seeing in different kinds of natural selection. OK, the last topic we're going to cover today is patterns in evolution. So once evolution has occurred, scientists have identified three primary patterns in evolution as a whole, in the change in species. And the first and probably most common one is divergence. This is that one that I, I showed you when I was drawing, you know, when I drew with the, uh, the divergence that looked like this. This is divergence right here. Okay, when evolution causes species with a common ancestor to become more different from each other. So some examples of that, the divergent evolution of the finches on the Galapagos Islands, or the divergent evolution of the different kinds of tortoises. Another pattern of evolution is coevolution. This is when two species evolve together so that each selectively puts pressure on the other. The example of the moth when we were talking about natural selection with these flowers that had the very long nectary where the where the nectar is stored way down here at the end. And the only kind of animal that could get there would have to have a very, very long tongue, much longer than any other kind of pollinating insect. And the moth has this moth, which they ultimately found, as Darwin predicted they would, uh, does have that very long tongue to get down into this nectary. So over time, the flower's tube gets longer, and the tube of the moth, the mouth part of the moth continues to increase in length as well as they co-evolve together. Uh, the final pattern of evolution is convergent evolution. And this is when species independently evolve traits that are similar but not present in their common ancestors. So if we think of uh, pterodactyls, an uh, ancestral flying maybe or gliding kind of dinosaur, uh, bats and birds, these animals, their ancestors, their common ancestors didn't fly. They walked or they got around some other way, yet all of them have evolved a wing. And that's just because a wing is good for flying. Not because they evolved from a common ancestor, but because the shape of the wing is required for flight. And not to be outdone, plants have done the same thing. Um, these are two plants which are distantly related to each other, but not directly related. They look very similar, but their relatives don't look anything like this. They're tall, branching, tree-like structures in some cases. And because of the environment they live in, the environment selected these forms to, that, that fit, that survived very well. And they end up looking very much alike, though they evolved very differently from each other. Okay, so those are our patterns in evolution. Um, I did uh, use a variety of sources today, and I thank all those who contributed photographs to my presentation. And I hope you've learned a little something about the process of evolution, uh, natural selection pressures, and the way that species are created.